Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to just thank the organisers for the invitation to speak. It's great to be here in Uppsala, hometown of Linnaeus. Now, I'd love to give this talk in Swedish, in honour of Linnaeus. Men, ursäkta, jag talar lite svenska. And it's an international meeting, so I will continue in English. What I'm going to do is cover uh, high throughput sequencing and its applications in clinical microbiology, in particular focus on two case studies from my own work, looking at Acinetobacter and E. coli, and then just leave some thoughts dangling about the future of microbiology. Now, I don't have to say much about high throughput sequencing to this audience. Uh, fundamentally, new approach is much, much faster, much, much cheaper than anything else we've seen before. Uh, it brings to mind, in fact, the lively competition we see between different platforms and the continual improvement brings to mind that phrase from Trotsky of permanent revolution. Uh, and also people talk about Moore's law, but with sequencing we actually have a super Moore's law where we're going even faster uh, than Moore's law currently. The problem is that diagnostic microbiology, although we're in the 21st century, is still relying on 19th century technology, so quite a contrast there. So what the, the clinical microbiology, particularly clinical bacteriologists, relies on is microscopy and culture. Uh, growing colonies, uh, growing organisms in pure cultures, colonies. These approaches date back to the late 19th century, not even the 20th century, back to the time of Koch and Pasteur. Now I'm a bit of a radical, I like to try and push the boundaries, and what I propose is that our future vision should be that high throughput sequencing becomes a method of choice for diagnosis and infection. And in a sense, medical microbiology just becomes a branch of, of clinical chemistry or genomic medicine. Now, I, uh, not many of my microbiology colleagues agree with me on that one yet. I haven't sold the vision yet, but watch this space. If we're going to do this, though, we have a number of approaches that we can use. Uh, we can culture organisms, in, get them in pure culture, isolate DNA from them, and then uh, get whole genome sequences. And that's obviously been going on for 15 years or so, but now it's much easier than it ever was before. And then there are various culture-independent approaches. One of the most popular is what we might call phylogenetic profiling, where you amplify up a molecular barcode, the 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene, uh, and use that to determine the contents of a microbial community. Uh, as an alternative, you can use metagenomics, where you just do shotgun sequencing of DNA extracted from a community. And in fact, that works also where, for viruses. Uh, when you're, say, doing, uh, using cDNA, you can uh, isolate viruses that way as well, sequences. And in fact, um, this, this, uh, th th these uh, screen dumps here illustrate some of the first papers really showing us culture-independent pathogen discovery, uh, looking at various viruses uh, that were discovered uh, purely through sequencing, uh, just shotgun sequencing of cDNA from various patients. Bacteriologists are somewhat behind the virologists in this, and there are f a few examples out there, but not many, of people using these uh, culture-independent approaches to detect pathogens. Here is, a, again, a, a screen dump from a paper uh, by, from Scott Dowd, who's one of the pioneers uh, in the USA of using this approach. And in this paper, what he showed was that if you use molecular approaches to look at wounds and what's inside a wound in terms of bacterial uh, pathogens, uh, and then use that information to guide your therapy, you get a better outcome for the patient. Um, and, and this is really one of the few, if probably the only paper, where we have such quite definitive answers to the question of whether this is worth doing. Another... Uh, the theme running through this is the idea of genomic epidemiology, of using whole genome sequences to track the evolution and spread of bacteria within uh, communities and within hospitals, sometimes within hospitals across continents. Um, and this really burst on the scene two or three years ago with a crop of papers here um, and, and is continuing now. We're seeing, we're seeing probably uh, two dozen papers on, on this kind of thing. In Birmingham, we've been doing this kind of stuff since 2009. Um, we have a blog, and uh, bioinformatician who works for me, Nick Lohman, 
you can tell he really is a geek because this is what he said when we got our 454. He said, I was anticipating to, today like a kid waiting for Santa Claus. Uh, and we, this is uh, one of my colleagues, Charles Penn, uh, standing by the crate as our 454 sequencer arrived back then. Looking a bit rather silly, actually. Um, since then, we've, had, uh, we've got two more platforms for Iron Torrent and MySQL also available to us. Now, what I'm going to start with uh, in the case studies is start with this one, Acinetobacter baumannii, which is an organism we've spent some time studying in the last few years. This is a gram-negative bacteria, a gram-negative bacillus, and the reason it's attracted attention is that it's multi-drug resistant, uh, and it's one of those agents, one of those organisms that is getting very close to what some people call the post-antibiotic apocalypse, where we actually run out of treatment options. Um, at the moment, things like calistin and, and tigercycline are, are, are held as reserve agents for this organism. Uh, and it's resistant to most other things. It's associated with wound infections, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, sometimes gets into the blood, causes bloodstream infections, usually in critically ill patients in hospitals. It's not something that the average person on the street is ever going to get an infection with. Uh, it has been seen particularly in returning military personnel, initially from the Iraq war and now uh, also from Afghanistan. And it's clear when military patients go into a civilian healthcare environment, they can then transmit their infection to civilian patients. There are various problems with this organism. It's hard to identify in the clinical laboratory. And in fact, there are two related genomo species, which have now actually been given Linnaean names, Linnaean binomials of Pitti and Nosoconialis, which are really pretty much impossible to distinguish phenotypically from Acinetobacter baumannii. There are a variety of different molecular methods that have been used to identify outbreak strains and to type strains, but uh, these are not uh, discriminatory enough for us to actually look down inside uh, local epidemics, local outbreaks in hospitals. They'll just lump everything together as indistinguishable. We also don't know uh, how this organism becomes resistant uh, as it evolves towards more and more resistance. We don't, haven't got a good idea about that. And we don't really understand much about how it actually functions as a pathogen. So we set ourselves uh, a number of questions uh, to, to be addressed when using high-throughput sequencing uh, to, to look at this organism. So we wanted to know, could we actually use whole genome sequencing to detect differences between isolates within an outbreak? And if we could, could that actually give us any clues about transmission chains uh, within the outbreak? Um, also, what can we learn about uh, the emergence of resistance, for example, in the individual patient, where they start off with a sensitive strain and it becomes resistant? And then, uh, again, uh, relevant to Linnaeus, what can uh, we, we say about defining a species within a genus using uh, whole genome sequencing and high throughput sequencing? So our first foray into genomic epidemiology of Acinetobacter uh, goes back a few years, focused on an outbreak that happened in a hospital in Birmingham in 2008. And the isolates with, from that outbreak were all indistinguishable by current type of methods. This is being written up in the Journal of Hospital Infection. And what we did, we did 454 genome sequencing of six isolates from the outbreak, and then did SNP detection by mapping those reads against the draft reference assembly. We were particularly concerned about uh, false positives, and so we went very carefully through uh, and threw away anything that didn't uh, look absolutely trustworthy. And we even then went on to validate the SNPs that we found by Sanger sequencing of, of PCR amplicons from the uh, relevant regions. So what did we find? Well, in fact, in the outbreak, we only found three loci where there were SNPs in the genomes of these isolates. What we did was we polarized the change by looking at a, a completely unrelated strain, this AB57 there, that showed us what the ancestral state was. And then we tabulated uh, the SNPs that we saw. Uh, we had, in this uh, outbreak, four, uh, four uh, military patients and two civilian patients. Now, when you look at that, you kind of think, well, don't really see any pattern emerging from that. Does, what's this, what all this going to tell us? But what we did was we then looked at how that mapped on to time and space within the outbreak. And what we found is we look at these SNP genotypes there. You can see that there are um, patients 
four patients together in one uh, six-bedded unit, one out in the main ITU, and one on a completely separate ward, the trauma unit. And what you can see there is that there is patient M2 in an adjacent bed to patient C2, M2, the isolate is, is isolated first, and then an isolate with exactly the same genotype, identical genome, isolated from C2. So on the principle of parsimony, we made the conclusion that uh, there had been cross-infection between this military patient and this civilian patient. Those of you who are awake this morning will say, well, hang on, what about patient M4, who has the same genotype? Well, it turns out that patient M4 and M2 are both military patients that were repatriated from Afghanistan through exactly the same care pathway. So we've made the assumption that they acquired their uh, acetobacter infection uh, from a common source before they came to the hospital. Now you may say, well, doing all this genome sequencing just to tell us that one patient infected another seems like a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And I would agree, but this was our first foray into this area. And before we started, we didn't even know if we'd find any SNPs or whether we'd find uh, any patterns that could be interpreted at all. So we were quite pleased that we got something out of this. Second study we did um, with colleagues in, in London, uh, Mike Hornsey and, and people in the HPA, Health Protection Agency, Neil Woodford and, and so on, was to look at two isolates from the same patient. Um, now, we didn't do the sequencing here, uh, and I, so I can't defend the fact that one of them was 454 sequence and then the other one was a Lumina sequence. It was a bit of a bizarre way of doing things. But we got that data, uh, and Nick Lohman in my group analysed this data to see if we could determine what had happened in the genome of the isolate uh, when, as it became resistant to this tiger cycling antibiotic. And here we found more SNPs than we'd found in our outbreak. In fact, 18 SNPs detected between the two isolates. And nine of them were non-synonymous. And one of them was actually, uh, Jesus, uh, fortunately for us, was in a gene which was already known to account for resistance uh, in this organism, in a, in a regulator, two-component regulator, ADES. So that provided an explanation of how it became resistant. But the other thing that we found that was completely unexpected and counterintuitive, normally when you look at a resistant isolate compared to a sensitive one, you expect there to be more DNA in the resistant isolate. Usually it's acquired through horizontal transfer. But here, in fact, parts of the genome had dropped out uh, between the sensitive and the resistant one. And uh, these deletions, one of those deletions actually truncated the gene MUT-S, uh, which is a DNA repair, uh, encodes a DNA repair enzyme. And... Um, we believe that this is what caused the increase in mutation rate, and there's evidence from other pathogens that this is the kind of, um, and you see the similar kind of thing in cancers where you lose the ability to repair DNA and that increases the mutation rate uh, and then, if you like, primes the lineage to then become resistant. Again, coming back to Linnaeus, um, what is a bacterial species is a question so deep and long that I could speak for hours on it. But what we, we made a foray into this by looking at the phylogenomics of species within this genus, Acinetobacter. And what we did was we sequenced 13, uh, 13 new draft genome sequences representing 10 species from this genus. And then we scooped up everything that was in the public domain as well on the genus. So we ended up analysing 38 Acinetobacter uh, genomes. And what we found was that actually, if you take the, the commonly used molecular barcode 16S, Really, it wasn't very good at all at delineating what were the accepted species, what bacteriologists had already agreed should be named as species within this genus. But then we, we actually then took uh, the core genome uh, of these organisms. We picked out the, uh, those coding sequences that were common to all of them um, and did some phylogeny based on that. And we found that that did indeed reflect the currently accepted taxonomy, although it did identify three misclassifications of strains from various culture collections. Um, and we then, that was, that's quite a, a processor-intensive approach. Uh, we then said, is there a quick way we can actually do this? And we picked up on something that had uh, been described in literature already called average nucleotide identity. And we found that, in fact, that was a very quick way of um, delineating species. So this is what you get if you look at the whole genome, uh, what well, the core genome phylogeny. And you can see here that uh, the species are all coming out as monophyletic groups, apart from a couple of uh, examples where things were misclassified. So you can see there's 
something that's called characteristicus here, clustering with PTI, but in fact we've, we, we, we're confident that that is actually a misclassification there. And when you look at average nucleotide identity, you get a similar kind of branching pattern. And also, as has been suggested before by others, if you take a 5% cutoff in terms of average nucleotide identity, that actually provides a, a, a reliable guide to species uh, delineation within this genus. So we we're pleased that those two uh, approaches have gone well together. So what we're proposing is that if we use phylogenetic analysis and ANR, you have a kind of pragmatic method for species delineation and even definition. You know, we could define a species as a monophyletic group of isolated genomes that exhibit uh, greater or equal to 95% pairwise ANI. We, we have kind of tentatively suggested this means that we could actually perhaps get rid of phenotypic definitions of species. Uh, we're being very revolutionary here. This is currently under review at PNAS. It's gone out to review, and I'm just waiting any day now. It's going to come back with all sorts of uh, critiques from traditional taxonomists telling us that we can't say these things. But we'll see how we go. Second case study is on, uh, is on uh, Escherichia coli. Uh, this is a very... Uh, well-known organism to biologists as a premier model organism. Um, it is also a very common gut commensal, and over 90% of the people in this room are carrying E. coli in their bowel at the moment. Uh, kangaroos, the cattle, all carrying this organism. It's used in biotechnology, it's used as a probiotic, and if you're interested to know about its, uh, its, its life as a, as a model organism, this book, Microcosm, by a friend of mine, Carl Zimmer, is a good place to start. Although feel free to point out to Carl Zimmer's edit, uh, editor that um, this is not how you do Latin binomials. Uh, and, you know, Linnaeus will be turning his grave the way they put that on his uh, book cover there. It's a very versatile pathogen, though. In addition to being a model organism and a commensal, it affects all sorts of hosts and many different organ systems. And even in humans, we have many different varieties that infect the bowel. We have enteropathogenic, enterotoxigenic, enterovasive, enterohemorrhagic, enteroagulative, diffusive adherent varieties. And in fact, Shigella, uh, although it has its own Linnaean binomial, uh, is now considered to be just a variety of E. coli. Uh, and the taxonomists haven't kind of caught up on that yet. So uh, just over a year ago, uh, there was a large outbreak of E. coli, a particular kind of E. coli, I mean 104H4, that hit Germany, um, and these figures are slightly out of date now. There's over 4,000 cases, but there's over 50 deaths associated with this particular outbreak. Eventually, it was linked to sprouting seeds, although there were some um, red herrings along the way, if you like, in terms of cucumbers and so forth. It had a very high risk of a, a syndrome called hemolytic uremic syndrome, which can be fatal, uh, and for reasons that are not clear, uh, females seem to be particularly at risk. Um, I don't think there's been a, a, a particularly good explanation of that. One explanation may be that, that, um, that, that real men don't eat bean sprouts, and that's perhaps why the, <laughs> there was this, this, this disposition there. Um, here's the epidemic curve of the outbreak. You can see uh, just over a year and a week or, or so ago, it was at its peak, and it, uh, this time last year, it was still uh, kind of rippling away. Um, and uh, so this so-called sugar toxin-producing E. coli uh, was particularly notable for the fact that it had such a high uh, kind of symptom load in terms of hemolytic uremic syndrome. Now, at the heart, at the centre of this outbreak, there's this guy here, here, Dr. Holger Roder, uh, in uh, Hamburg, in the hospital there. And he was trying to make sense of what was going on. It was really a time of crisis. He said that they were having to put up temporary beds all over the place. They even had some gay men coming in saying that we've been using cucumbers as sex aids. What should we do? Are we, should, are we at risk? And all, you know, all sorts of issues were coming out of that outbreak. And, and he didn't know what to do. Uh, he, he had obviously a key resource there. He had uh, isolates of the, of the outbreak strain. And so what do you do when you're in that situation? Well, anyone who's been brought up in the English-speaking world in my generation knows that you... You can call international rescue, uh, and if you call international rescue, uh, this is what arrives. Thunderbirds are go, and off we come. Now, he called on the international community. He didn't quite get uh, international rescue coming, and Thunderbirds, but he actually ended up 
collaborating with BGI and Shenzhen. Uh, and the isolate was sent from, to, uh, from uh, Hamburg to Shenzhen in China and was then sequenced on uh, their iron torrent, which they actually had on trial. They just thought, oh, let's see if we can get something useful with this iron torrent. Um, then they did something that was actually quite remarkable, is that they said, oh, well, we don't know what to do with this data. They just put it into the public domain without any strings attached at all. Um, and then Nick Lohman from my group, we, we'd actually just uh, taken receipt of an iron torrent as well, and we were just learning how to assemble bacterial genome data sequence data on the Iron Torrent platform. So Nick jumped on this data and said, oh, I know how to use this. Uh, and uh, he was actually at a bioinformatics conference at the time. Uh, and so he posted on, the, on a blog saying, look, I've got this stuff here uh, from uh, the, the outbreak strain, from BGI's uh, sequence, and I've uh, assembled it, and I've put my assembly back up in the, the public domain. Why don't we all have some fun and analyze it? Uh, and it, using blogs and Twitter, the thing snowballed from there. So within 24 hours of its release, the genome had been assembled by Nick, but within two days, it had been assigned to an existing lineage. Within five days, strain-specific tests had been released. Within a week, there were over two dozen reports on the biology and evolution of the strain that had been filed on an open-source wiki uh, by bioinformaticians working around the world. So one of the first to jump in here was a guy who, who, who blogs under the name of Mad, uh, Mike the Mad Biologist. Um, the real name is Mike Felgarten. And he came in and said, well, actually, everyone's been saying this is a totally new strain, but looking at this genome sequence data, I can see that it's not, and that similar strains have been seen before. Um, and, and then it just snowballed from there, using Twitter and blogs and so forth. And you can see here uh, the list of, of people that had posted on this uh, particular wiki uh, within the, the few weeks that followed. And uh, well, I think one of the inspiring things, you can just look at the, 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 the names there and you can see the international flavour of this activity here. You've got people with Polish names, English names, uh, Spanish names, Chinese names, um, Muslim names, all contributing uh, to this activity. Now, I said to Nick, well, this is all very well, but in the university environment, what we're supposed to do is produce peer-reviewed research papers, and a few tweets and blog posts do not equate to a peer-reviewed research publication. He said, don't be such a grumpy old man. You know, this is new and revolutionary, and uh, you're just missing the point. So, actually, we did manage to square the circle. Uh, working with the, the, the uh, German and Chinese collaborators, I managed to write up a paper for the New England Journal of Medicine which included a case study of the family outbreak, of a family outbreak from Germany, emphasised the, the journey that we took in actually doing all this crowdsourced analysis of the genome. So rather than just saying this is a genome sequence paper, because we knew that there were others in competition with us, we emphasised this new way of, of doing science. Uh, and because we wanted consistency, though, we actually then repeated all the analyses in-house. Uh, Nick Lohman did that to, to, to check everything over. And uh, so we were very lucky. We got our paper into New England Journal. Here we are celebrating some champagne with our German collaborators in, in Hamburg. In fact, we went in back to back with a, another paper uh, using the Pacific Bios the Sciences um, platform to sequence uh, a, a larger number of, of, of E. coli. But we were very pleased that we'd actually managed to uh, get both uh, an exciting new way of doing science, but a peer-reviewed paper out of it as well. Takeaway messages from all this, well, it's clear that infection is still a threat to even the most advanced societies, uh, and, and uh, you know, we can't dismiss infection as a, as a problem in our societies. Pathogens don't bother with passports. Uh, as Mike had pointed out, this is not a new strain, being seen before uh, in, in various parts of the world. And in fact, the closest genome sequence strain at the time actually had come from the Central African Republic, and it belonged to what is uh, commonly called an enteroagrative lineage. So this was quite a surprise. Because everyone assumed that these, this sugar toxin producing E. coli would come from uh, what we call an enterohemorrhagic uh, lineage, like E. coli 0157, but that wasn't the case. Um, and one conclusion that one could draw from this is that this strain probably was spreading in the human population and going from human to human, rather than is often the case with the enterohemorrhagic E. coli coming from an animal source, uh, from cow manure or, or, or something like that. And clearly the, the bacteria were evolving very quickly um, and 
uh, pathotypes that we tried to define in the past that actually seem to be over overlap and evolve. And one, wor one worrying thing was that this organism was also antibiotic resistant, even though you don't use antibiotics to treat this kind of infection. Um, and so, you know, that, 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 that was a worrying sign. We termed this open source genomics uh, as a kind of name for this propitious confluence of high throughput genomics. Uh, crowdsourced analysis and a very liberal approach to data release. And again, I have to take my hat off to BGI for actually releasing that data and kickstarting this in the first place. And the other thing that's important to note is that things like blogging and Twitter can actually augment the usual channels of academic discourse. Uh, you know, you get, I don't know if it's the same with you, but many colleagues are very uh, dismissive of, of, of these things and what, you know, you should be doing proper research and so on. But in fact, here was an example where using these media actually uh, meant we could do things better. Just in the last few minutes, uh, just move on to thinking about benchtop sequencing more generally. So Iron Torrent is one of three uh, of these uh, models that you can call benchtop sequencers, about the size of a laser printer that fit neatly on your bench. Um, and here are the three that uh, have been released. Now, through our collaborations with the Health Protection Agency in, in, in England, um, we had access uh, to a 454 Junior, uh, and they had access also to the MySeq. We had our own iron torrent. And we thought, well, actually, why don't we act look at this uh, outbreak strain and sequence it using each of the platforms and see, do a compare and contrast and see what we find. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, we had this published in Nature Biotechnology's performance comparison of the bench top high throughput sequencing platforms. Um, I guess for those in the know, perhaps there's not too many surprises here. We, the the MySeq had the highest throughput per run and lowest error rates. GS Junior had the longest reads, um, but the lowest throughput and also a very expensive way of sequencing. Uh, the Iron Torrent had the highest throughput uh, uh, per hour. And of course, uh, I think, again, it's probably not too much of a surprise that both the Iron Torrent and the 454 technologies have problems with homopolymers. Now, Nick Lohman is best, much better placed than I am to go through the technicalities of how he did these analyses and how what error models and so forth are used. As a, 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 a microbiologist, I was more interested in what do these platforms tell us about the biology of the organism? And so we chose a number of um, coding sequences that we thought were important to the biology of the organism from a microbiology point of view. So things like adhesins, antibiotic resistance genes, the shigatoxin, uh, these uh, other uh, autotransporters, the spates there. And um, this, this shows you what kind of results we got in terms of whether we got full length reconstruction of those coding sequences using different platforms and different assemblers. And you can see that no, no platform, no assembly uh, pipeline actually delivered perfect results. Um, the, the best we got was with, with the MySeq, uh, but even there we, we found some of these spates, these uh, autotransporters, very long repetitive genes had actually been broken. But you can see that you do get, uh, you get useful information from, from all of these platforms and from all of these assemblers, but the quality of the information you get does vary. Does it matter which platform you use well, and, and, and how you, you do things? Well, there are problems, clearly, with SNPs near homopolymers with some platforms. Uh, if you increase the coverage, it makes problems go away in the, for the most part, but not always. Um, read length, as you might expect, is a major limiting factor for de novo assemblies. And it's clear that all whole, whole genome sequences are not created equally. Depending on the platform you use, you're going to get different kinds of information. At the moment, we do not have a platform that delivers uh, the whole chromosome as one contig fully accurate uh, in one go for a bacterium. Right, the very last few minutes now. How do we actually move to what we might call microbiology 2.0? So go back to the challenge I set at the beginning. Why, why are we still culturing things? Why don't we just take this poo here and turn it directly into sequence? What happens if we do that? Well, with, with our collaborators in Hamburg, we've actually uh, taken on that challenge. And, and in the last few weeks, we've actually done a couple of runs on our uh, MySeq um, on DNA extracted from feces 
from the German E. coli outbreak. Um, so they did the, the DNA extractions in Germany, sent us the DNA, and then we sequenced it. Uh, so no amplification using PCR, no uh, growing anything on agar plates. Just sequence the poo and see what happens. And this is what we found. And um, we took actually the first run here, run one, was done on what was known to be an E. coli from someone infected uh, sorry, known to be a faeces sample with someone infected with the E. coli and actually having quite a high uh, colony count of E. coli. Run 2 was done on someone who uh, actually had diarrhoea at the same time as the outbreak, but actually had salmonella as the cause of the diarrhoea. And uh, we, we've really only just started analysing this data. In fact, the, the MySeq didn't work properly on Run 1. We only got data in one direction. Um, but one of the striking things was we got a lot of human uh, sequences from that run, uh, much more than we got from run two. Um, and also we got a lot of, uh, back, we got a, lot, um, a very simple kind of picture when it came to the bacterial reads. And in fact, um, Nick has mapped the reads against the E. coli 104 genome and found that he's getting not much short of tenfold coverage of that E. coli genome just from uh, sequences in that uh, sequencing run. And, um, you know, fairly even coverage. And interestingly, the sugar toxin coding phage there is appearing as a blip, a slightly higher coverage uh, than other parts of the genome. And that makes sense because the sugar toxin is released when the phage, the bacterial virus, actually undergoes, uh, causes lysis of cells and, and produces lots and lots of copies of the phage. So that kind of makes sense as well. So we're very pleased that we could actually, uh, the, clearly the information is there in, in that uh, DNA and we're now in the process of, of analysing it, trying to work out what's the best way to analyse it, uh, see if we can get an assembly out of that uh, without having to do mapping against a reference and so on. When uh, we looked at the, the one with uh, Salmonella in it, uh, things became a lot more complicated because the bacterial load in the, in the sample was obviously much more complex in terms of its population structure. So this was just trying to use a simple binning approach for the sequences to try and work out what was in there. And in fact, the salmonella appears over, over here in 31 more. It's actually one of the enterobacteriaceae, but it's actually quite a small number of reads. And, we, and we're not sure that we're going to get the whole genome covered evenly with this. The other problem that you can see with this kind of approach is that, in fact, it's telling us we've got Shigella in there because obviously some, occasionally things are coming out of high-scoring read just by chance happens to be a Shigella when, in fact, as a clinical microbiologist, you know that that's not Shigella, that's just the E. coli. It's obviously an E. coli, commensal E. coli in there as well. But it's very early days, and we're, uh, this, this data was actually just generated uh, two days ago. So. so where are we at? Well, in the English-speaking world, we have a phrase... Uh, that the cup is either half full or half empty. You know, this is glass half full or half empty. I would like to think that we're actually at a stage where we're kind of half full in this, put a, a positive spin on things. We, we, it's clear that genome sequencing brings the adva many advantages. It's kind of open-ended. Instead of designing a specific PCR for a specific uh, pathogen or specific gene, it just reveals everything that's in there, the unknown unknowns. Every organism has DNA or RNA, um, so it's got universal applicability, provides the ultimate in resolution. So if, uh, if you've got the genome, then that you've got all the information that's there. And I think I can say that benchtop sequencing is poised to revolutionise microbiology. Uh, as we pointed out, platforms have the current platforms have defined strengths and weaknesses. And of course, it's also worth pointing out this permanent revolution is not over. We ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, probably many of you have seen the. Um, various videos about the Oxford Nanopore platform, which is going to be launched in a few months' time, where you just have a little USB device, USB stick, you can pet your DNA in, plug it into your computer, and the DNA streams onto your computer in real time. If it's true, it's just going to be amazing. It's going to transform things once again, and, and uh, we don't quite know where we're going to be in a year or two, what's going to be the best way to do sequencing, um, if this is all true. Of course, it could be hype. Um, we'll have to wait and see uh, and, and test it out in the real world. There are still some challenges with all this. Uh, so the cup is, you can argue the cup's half empty because one problem with bacteriology, and it's true 
all organisms, I guess, to some degree, is that genotype does not always predict phenotype. So there are some examples in, in bacteriology where we can look at mutations and we can say, oh, that's what it means, very robustly. So, for example, with tuberculosis, if we, look, we know what other mutations are associated with resistance for the most part, and we can say, oh, that's rifampicin resistant by looking at the genome. But there are many other examples where that's not quite so simple. Uh, a, a single base pair change in a promoter may upregulate or downregulate some regulator that then has lots of pleiotrophic effects. So that is one problem. The other problem is that uh, it, up till now, in these kind of genomic epidemiology approaches, we've made the assumption that everything in that clonal population on the patient is actually identical. But we know that's not the case. Um, the Amerithrax uh, investigations um, have shown that they actually hinged on showing that there were colony variants within the population of anthrax bacilli that were actually there in very low numbers, I think around 1 in 50. And if you did just genome sequence the whole population, you wouldn't have noticed that. You had to culture it out and look for those colonial morphotypes first. Um, and it's clear also from, uh, cancer biologists are now telling us quite clearly that although cancers are clonal in the sense of descending from one cell, they are not homogeneous, that there is Darwin's descent with modification going on within that population. There is also a problem that even with genome sequencing, sometimes indistinguishable really does mean identical. So we've seen that in, with our acetobacters. Um, if, you're, if you wanted to, trans, to, to try and track the spread of, say, leprosy within Mumbai, there's no way you could use genome sequencing because the organism evolves so slowly that you would never be able to actually get transmission chains teased out through these kind of approaches. Sequencing a genome, also different things on different platforms, uh, and we have to be kind of careful about that and how we deal with that uh, when we're comparing uh, different uh, data sets. My own discipline, clinical microbiology, is a very conservative discipline as well, and uh, there's considerable challenges ahead in terms of, okay, we can do this in a university academic environment, but is anyone ever really going to do it in a hospital? Um, and there are all sorts of challenges there, actually communicating with clinicians and clinical microbiologists. Uh, many organisations are heavily unionised and people are employed to do a particular job. They're employed to do PFGE or MLST or whatever. And if you say you're, you now have to learn how to sequence genomes, they'll say, no, I don't. Um, so, you know, we don't know how it's going to go. And although I think we, if we came back in 10 or 20 years, we will see sequencing clearly having a role in microbiology, whether it actually replaces everything else is unclear. Um, so radio has survived, even though you could argue that television is a richer medium and should have replaced it. But, but there are niches where radio survives. And similarly, culture and conventional approaches may well survive alongside sequencing. So, to use a rather florid metaphor, which I used in a, in a recent uh, paper, you know, the promised land is in sight, but there are still many rivers to cross. Here's Moses looking across at the promised land, all those sequences shimmering in the sky there. Um, if you've been interested in, in what I said, we, we, we can come look at our blog, follow myself and Nick on Twitter. Um, I'm actually recording this talk, and I'll put it up on YouTube over the weekend. And if anyone wants to come and work in Birmingham with us, we've just launched this new scheme in Birmingham called the Birmingham Fellowship Scheme. So just Google Birmingham Fellowships uh, and find out how you can come and work there. And I'll just put up the acknowledgement slide. I'm not going to go through everyone individually. I think I'm just about finished now. So that's it.